Friends, thank you so much for joining us. This is Nkosina Timaduleke. I'm so excited to be able to come to you with the Word of God. And this is a season uh, that the Word of God is coming down so strong in my heart. And I felt, look, let me share with you. If you are joining us for the first time, this is the Prayer Factory. We are a ministry uh, that is aimed at equipping believers particularly in the areas of prayer, in the areas of the word, and in the areas of faith. Um, these three things are critical and are key to our function and our existence as a ministry. We believe strongly in our identity, our um, union, and our participation in Christ. So that's who we are. But today I'm just here to speak about the prophetic and the apostolic. I've been having this pressure in my heart for us to get into these two offices of the New Testament in particular and gain some insights so that we can function optimally in these two areas as a church. I just want to put a disclaimer out there. I am not an apostle. I am not a prophet. I do not want to create an environment where it seems as though I am trying to defend myself. I believe in two things that are critical, are important, and are criteria to anyone adopting a title. One is that it must be impressed in your heart from the Lord, uh, a calling. There must be a calling into ministry. And, and, and calling, before we talk about offices, there must be a strong sense of being called to active ministry. Not simply the ministry of reconciliation wherein all believers are called to function. But we are speaking about strategic functionality within the body wherein you are now a minister. There must be that fundamental call. There must be that fundamental assurance in your heart that I'm called into this thing. The second thing is that the church plays a role to affirm that call. The church plays a role. So the elders of the church have the responsibility to affirm a calling upon your life. You can't simply self-designate. You can't simply self-appoint. You can't simply self-ordain um, uh, into ministry. It, it doesn't work like that. And we can't because of our pressure, because of the fire in us, because of the desire to serve, self-designate without the proper approval and affirmation by the local church. It has to be done that way, unfortunately. Uh, so, so I'm not speaking as one who is trying to defend any position here. I'm speaking as one who is just trying to find a basis for scriptural understanding and biblical understanding of particular things within the kingdom. And in, in this time, we are interested in understanding the apostolic and the prophetic. So today we are going to speak specifically on understanding the role of the New Testament prophetic office and ministry. What is the role of the New Testament prophetic uh, uh, office and ministry? I'm not a prophet. I've already made that very clear. So do not take it from me um, to be subjective. I'm, I'm trying to be very objective here and I'm going to bring in elements of, of both parties. You know, in, in um, let's read, let's read. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 13. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 to 13. Keep this scripture in the back of your mind. Keep this scripture in your heart as we deal with these offices. Keep this scripture. We'll keep coming back to it. The Bible says, I'm reading from the English Standardized Version, and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, other version says pastors, the shepherds and teachers. So it's apostles, prophets, evangelists, prof uh, shepherds or pastors, and teachers to equip the saints. To equip the saints. So the Lord, he, there speaks about Jesus Christ. So these offices are given by the Lord Jesus Christ. And they are given with a specific purpose of equipping the saints. Now keep that word in mind, to equip. Now to equip does not simply mean to state a truth. It does not simply mean to give you information. It does not simply mean to kind of 
um, uh, and for a lack of a better word, guide. It does not simply mean that. It means an intentional system or method of training. A system of building up with an intention that someone would mature. So the Bible says here, this is Paul. He says the Lord Jesus Christ gave all of these offices with the purpose or an objective of equipping equipping when when there is no equipping the office may be there but it does not serve its purpose the gift may be there but it does not serve its purpose if it does not equip and specifically equip the saints equip the saints for what he says for the work of the ministry in other words the saints when they come into the gathering of believers when the saints show up to what we call today church, when the saints show up to home cell, when the saints show up to Bible study, when the saints show up to the gathering of believers, it is so that they are equipped to the work of the ministry. In other words, these places of gathering become in and of themselves filling stations, refill stations. They do not become in and of themselves destinies or destinations. They become filling stations. So these are places where the saints are equipped so that the saints can go back and function in the area of ministry. Ministry. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Romans chapter 8, the entire creation is awaiting for the revelation or the revealing of the sons. Why the sons must be revealed? Because they have a purpose. They have a ministry to fulfill. So the believers are equipped for ministry. One, two, these offices are existing for the building up of the body of Christ. They do not self-serve. They do not self-serve. I mean, it's impressed to, for, to me to say this. And I don't want to be controversial. Not yet to rebuke anyone. But the culture of isolation amongst particular office bearers, the culture of isolation, the culture of being me, me, and me alone, the culture of narcissism, the culture of wanting to be celebrated as the ultimum or the, 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 the climax of, of God revealing himself to man. This culture of wanting to isolate myself as the apostle, as the prophet, as the evangelist, as the teacher. This culture does not emanate from the Bible. And I dare say it does not emanate from the spirit of God. It doesn't. Because the Bible says the giving of these offices are to equip the saints into being built up as a body. So firstly, the saints are being equipped. In other words, these offices serve only to bring us to a place where we are equipped, where we are functional for ministry. In and of themselves, the offices are not destinations. The offices are there to bring us to a particular point of functionality as sons, as kings, as priests in the kingdom of God. Oh, glory to the Father. For the building up of the body of Christ. So the body is built up. The body is, the focus is the body. The focus is not the offices. The focus are not individuals that occupy or are graced or to function within offices or have particular gifts that can be likened to offices. The focus is not them. The focus is the body. He gave for the body. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. This, this is something that is close to my heart, my personal ministry. To bring us to a place where we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. To mature manhood. I love the word manhood in the ESV. To, this, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The fullness of Christ. The teleos of man. So the offices and the persons of the ministry here confined to the five, so-called the fivefold ministry, 
are given by Jesus Christ and they are not given to self-serve, they are given for the benefit of the body. We must understand. So contextually, we have to place Ephesians here in context. Paul is speaking to a definite and specific people when he says he gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. He's speaking to a definite group of people. In other words, he's not projecting to the future to say that in the future there will exist this particular people. He's speaking at a, a, a time wherein these offices were existing within the church. And this is one of the reasons why this, this, this thing called, we call it cessationalists. In other words, there are people who believe that all of these things that we're talking about today, the offices, particularly the apostolic and the prophetic, have ceased to exist in the body. In other words, they were only existing within the time frame of the early church and in particular, just after Jesus Christ has, 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 has arisen. And it's limited to the 12 uh, 12 plus 1 apostles and it is not necessarily something that is ongoing or continuing in the church that's called cessationalist or a cessation theory I, I'm not a subscriber of that I, I believe in what we would call continuous, uh, continuation or continuingist you know we, we, we believe that the gifts and the operations of the Holy Spirit continue within the church now there are many distinctions that we can make there wherein we can agree with brethren, even those who do not believe in this. There are many spaces where we agree around that area, um, particularly because I do not think that any one of us should claim to be equal to Peter as an apostle. I do not think that you will be, you will be uh, 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 within the parameters of, of, um, uh, of biblical correctness <laughs> if you want to equate yourself, for instance, to Paul. You know, so I agree that to an extent, the functionality, the nature and the existence of these offices have been have been altered to serve the church at a post modern environment at an environment wherein it is not at the foundational level, but it is at the building up level. I, I, I will bring I'll come back to this point. However, I want us to understand that Paul is speaking to a particular people, and that's important. Altogether, the ministry of these offices are to the degree that believers are equipped. I emphasize that point. The offices together work to the degree that the believers are equipped. Here, equipped does not mean simply to edify. Equip does not simply mean to encourage. Equip does not simply mean to guide. Equip does not simply mean to exhort. Equip does not mean simply mean to bring someone to an awareness of information. Hallelujah. Equip here was speaking about a process that ultimately brings one to maturity. That's what equip is after. To bring one into maturity into Christ. Who is our tell our tell you? Our the objective of the apostolic, the prophetic, the evangelistic, the pastoral, and the teaching ministries is to the end that we should mature. Hallelujah. Let's address this. What is a prophet? What is a prophet? In the New Testament, the New Testament we know it's in majority written or translated um, to our understanding now from the Greek. And in the Greek, the word prophet does not give us any meaning really because it's just a translation of the, of the Greek version of it, which is prophetess. So let's go to the Old Testament to understand particular things. So in the Old Testament, we then understand that uh, simply a prophet is someone who speaks the mind of God concerning a person, uh, concerning a people, concerning things. Someone who comes and gives you guidance with an, an instruction that seems to emanate from the Lord, uh, words that are coming from the Lord, visions that are coming from the Lord, perceptions that are coming from the Lord. That person serves and is called a prophet, simply. Someone who comes with a message from the Lord, not at the end extent of uh, or the, the, the level of an apostle who in themselves formulate and develop doctrinal teachings and understandings that guide the church, uh, into existence we're talking about someone who comes and says thou says the lord on this particular area this is the mind of god concerning this that's what a prophet is essentially 
So, but when we look at the Old Testament, there are four words that stem out from the Hebrew translations. Four words. Let's keep this, one, this in mind. Oh, I hope we can try to push. Uh, time is against me. There are four words that are in the Greek and in the, in the Hebrew that help us understand. Oh, glory to the Father. So, the first word I want us to look at is the word Nabi. The word Nabi. Um, the prophetic uh, 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 colleagues of mine would be very happy now. Nabi is N A B B I or N A B I Y. We read from Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5 to 9. The word of God says, Before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you, set you apart. I appointed you a prophet. The word prophet there is the word Nabi. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. So God is clearly saying that one is appointed by God himself to be a Nabi, a prophet. And the word Nabi um, translates directly to prophet in the English. But in the Hebrew, it is distinct from other realms of the prophetic. So this Nabi, let's read, let's read. Um, I'm going to check some verses that I like. You get to a place where the Bible says, But the Lord said to me, do not say I am only a youth. This is after the man of God, Jeremiah, responded to God. So the Lord says, don't say that I am only a youth. For to all whom I send you, you see, there's a, there's a, an element of being sent. A prophet is sent. For all, for to all whom, to whom I send you, you shall go. So a prophet is sent to all or to whomsoever God sends him to. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. A prophet speaks as commanded by God. So that's a Nabi. A Nabi receives insights. And by various means, I don't want to get to the place of now debating how do we hear God. That's a complete, another complete uh, or separate teaching by itself, how to hear God. But here we're speaking about someone who is able to, to decode a message from God. And that person is, by God's standard, sent by him to go and they shall go. And by God's standard, they are commanded by him to speak and they shall speak. So they speak from the perspective of being commanded by the Lord. Then the hand of the Lord and the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. Look at this. This is interesting. The Lord took out his hand and touched the mouth of Jeremiah, at least according to what Jeremiah is saying. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. So the Nabi speaks as the Lord is putting words into his mouth. Or whatever words that are coming from the mouth of the prophet stroke Nabi are words that the Lord put in his mouth through his hand. This is the word Nabi. And this is the popular word for prophet in the Old Testament. Prophet. The conventional, traditional prophet, one who hears from the Lord, either by a, a, an audible voice, by an internal voice, by perceptions, promptings, by, by, uh, by being able to decode in whatever way a message and this person is able to speak that message. So this is a prophet that speaketh. A prophet that speaks as he hears. Let's, let's say it like that for simplicity's sake. It's called a Nabi. In the Old Testament, again, we see another word, Ra, Ra, Ra. Ah, glory to the Father. Hey, I'm tempted. <laughs> oh, glory to the Father. I'm tempted. Ra. It's translated seer. Seer. There are two words for seer. So it seems to me then that the prophetic has, at the most simple level or basic level, two realms to it. There's a realm of, I hear, therefore I speak. And then there's a realm of, I see, therefore I speak. So a seer in the Old Testament is someone who would receive revelation, divine revelation, divine insights through visions, through imaginations through seeing. They would see into the spiritual realm, see uh, uh, and make up, even from natural objects or natural phenomena, they would be able to see and understand 
from dreams they will be able to see and have an understanding these are called seers in first samuel chapter 9 verse 9 the Bible brings us to understand something is important. Let's, let's read it from this. The whole chapter speaks about how Saul was looking for donkeys that had been lost and so forth. And it brings about a number of uh, uh, elements to the prophetic. But verse 9 says, Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he said, Come, let us go to the seer Raha. Or Ra. The seer Ra. So formerly, what today is called prophet at that day what today is called prophet nabi nabi was formerly called a seer ra so the word ra means seer but the word ra is also used was used previous it's as if it's as if this there was a time where prophets were simply called seers and then there was a development of this office or this this gift to a point where the prophetic is now established not simply as an office of the seer but a collective office wherein those who see those who hear those who by perception those who by 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 drips received from the lord are all together called prophets let's 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 let, let me show you something so there's a distinction between the one who sees. So the one who sees, who's the seer, the Ra, is one who sees by visions, dreams, imaginations, and other means. But this one sees. The point is that they are a seer. Now, the other is the Nabi, who is speaking mostly from hearing. Hearing from a spoken voice or an internal dialogue in their heart or other perceptions, but they are hearing. And they speak, therefore. So there's a distinction and we see that from Samuel chapter 9 verse 9 that there's a distinction. But it's not simply distinction too. There is continuancy. There is a sense that the office remains the same. There's a sense that it is simply that before this time a prophet was called a seer. Now we are saying it's a prophet but before then at that time when they were speaking the same prophet was called a seer. So there is a sense that there is a continuity between the realms of the prophetic. Hallelujah. Another word that is also translated to seer is the word chosa or chose, which is C-H-O-Z-E-H, chose. When you read from 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 9 to 10, the Bible says, And the Lord spoke to God, David, seer. So there was a gentleman called God. And I don't know why the Bible specifically uses the word Jose for this particular gentleman. I'm not sure why it is that. But in any case, in this case, the word Sia is, is translated from the word Jose in the Hebrew. And they are all translated to mean Sia. So you would understand David had a, had, had a gift of the prophetic. I, I'm sure those who are biblical scholars know this. David was prophetic he had the gift of prophecy and there were times where david on concerning matters of the nation concerning even personal matters he would seek the counsel of god from the medium of priests so priests in the old testament could also stand on behalf of someone and inquire from the lord intercession they will stand to intercede for someone inquiring from the Lord and be able to give direction. So David would mostly seek counsel from the medium of priests, but there were times wherein the counsel could, could come to David and came through a prophet, an, an ordinary nabi, who came at extraordinary occasions to admonish or chastise David, to give a rebuke, to give a stern warning, or to give admonition. And but there was another guy called God who seemed to have been either a close friend of David, a servant to David, um, one who stayed close to David, who was always in the counsel of David, giving counsel as a seer to the king. And this particular person is called a seer from the word chose. So probably this word speaks to the intimate relationship that the seer had with David, the king. And this was one who gives guidance, who gives counsel, who gives important um, uh, uh, 
specific circumstances or conditions of the spiritual realm to the king for understanding, for leading the people, for being able to dispense the administration of the kingdom of God. The king needed see us around him and there's a gentleman called God. Let's leave that uh, this at that. So we must understand that the prophetic office, although it clearly has realms, the realm of the seer, the realm of the one who is hearing, it is designed to be cohesive. Let's see an example where these two prophetic offices seem to be happening or existing in one area. In the book of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 29, verse 25, the Bible says, And he, Ezekiel, stationed the Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and with stringed instruments and with harps, according to the commandment of David and of God, the king's seer, and of Nathan, the prophet, the Nabi. And for thus was the commandment of the Lord by his prophets. So these prophets function to give counsel to the king, to give counsel to Israel. They function together as both as seer and as the nabis. So the, the, the prophetic office is cohesive. That's the point I'm making here. There's another word, the fourth word that I want us to look at in the Old Testament is the word nata or nata, nataf. So it's N-A-T-A-P-H, which truly speaking simply comes from the pre primitive root nataf. It means to ooze, um, that is to distill gradually, as, it, as if it drips, you know, you can imagine. I, I wanted to give an example that might be relevant in Central Africa or even in Mozambique, those who, do, who make rice wine or banana kind of wine, they call it moonshine. When you, you make this kind of wine, you need to distill it. In other words, you need to have a, a chamber wherein you are cooking. Um, or you are, I think that's the right word really. You are cooking this uh, uh, fermented mixture that is now alcoholic. Now this mixture evaporates as you cook it or the, the, the elements of it evaporate and they travel through a piped uh, environment and when there is a cooling down of that vapor, there would be drops at the end of this pipe. These drops will be falling into a collecting chamber wherein you are now collecting the actual substance that is going to be utilized as an alcoholic beverage. Now that process of distillation, that process of taking out uh, 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 concentrated, precise uh, substances from a mixture of of, a, of a, a chaotic environment is called distillation. So the word napta speaks about how a prophet is able to tap into an environment wherein there is utter confusion. And the word confusion here, I'm using it positively. It is, it, it is to say that there is a place wherein simplicity is not the business of the day. Things are complex. You can't simply understand. You... For instance, if you, you, you step out of your body and suddenly you are in, in, in heaven or in the realms of the spirit, there is not, it's not easy to understand what is happening. You, you can use inferences that I saw something like a pot of fire. I, I, I saw something that had a horn as though it was a horn of a unicorn. You are simply using analogies and systems of the physical world to give meaning to that which you see, which is complex. So the prophet is able to decode from this complex environment and distillation by, by a process of distilling, by a process of having, having perceptions. You, you have a perception, you have an intuition, you have a, a, a feeling, you, 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 you have a nudge. <laughs> and as you give into this nudge, you, you receive another drop. You receive another drop. You receive another drop. That, 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 that process of being, of ha having, having the ability or even the gift to be able to receive from the Lord, not always in bulk, but sometimes in drips and drops. It's what the Bible calls Nata. You know, suppose a, a prophet, the Bible says in Micah 2 verse 11, this, this verse, I like it because it speaks about falsehood, but... I want us to see the word nataf there. So Micah 2, Micah 2 verse 11 says, Suppose a prophet goes around telling lies. Love this. 
another versions are, are more clearer than this they say suppose a man man who claims to be spiritual or who claims to have a prophetic unction with them goes around telling lies and he prophesies that you will have plenty of wine and beer then that kind of prophet nataf would be just for this would be just right for this nation now Mike, I remember, is speaking here and he's speaking to a people who seem to have developed an appetite. And, and this is relevant. He's speaking to a people who have seemed to have developed an appetite for, for hearing things. And because they have an appetite for hearing things, it brings them to understand that because of this appetite that you have as a nation, an appetite for vileness, an appetite for, for different things, but also an appetite to want to hear. Because you have this appetite, there may arise a prophet who is not necessarily prophetic because they are true. But this prophet may arise with an intention to tell you lies. But because he prophesies about your very appetite. Oh, oh my God. He says you will have plenty of wine and beer. So he's prophesying of prosperity. And, and this is not necessarily to condemn anyone or to bring shame to a particular way of doing things or prophesying. I'm not there. But understand what the man of God here is, is, is detailing out and it's a caution. Wherein, because we have an appetite, there are prophecies that may arise that seems to stimulate and satisfy that appetite. Wherein a prophet can come and speak about plenty of wine, plenty, plenty coming your way. That kind of a prophet seems to be a prophet that this nation would celebrate. However, the word I'm after here is that the word prophet here is translated from the Greek nafta. In other words, it's one who is able to decode with drifts in a distilling method what exactly needs to be said. And this prophet, because he uses a strategy of, of, of walking in the spirit, and, and the word spirit there is the word wind, and the word wind is used appropriately to signify this that this man is, is walking in wind, is walking in prophecy that is void of nutriment for the soul. Oh, oh, I hope you got that. It, it, there is a prophetic that is actually void of any nutriment for the soul. That prophetic comes to satisfy edges and nudges and lustful desires that are equivalent to the physical. It's a kind of prophet who says, plenty of wine and beer is coming your way. It, it, it spoke about harvest, a great harvest. It speaks about a great a bountifulness. It speaks about a land of or a, 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 an opportunity for abundance. And he says, the challenge with this prophetic uh, is that sometimes it does not offer the necessary nutriment for the soul. It becomes unsubstantial. And remember, in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through to 13, we spoke about how the prophetic office amongst the five brings equip, equip, e, 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 an element of equipping the saints. Oh, I don't want to, to make things more difficult than how they are now. However, we must be careful of falsehood. And uh, when time allows us, we'll talk about that. So the key observation here is that the, New Test the Old Testament provides for us a basis of understanding as to the prophetic office, the nature and the role of the prophetic office. It brings us to a place where we, we understand the prophet used to bring knowledge, wisdom, information and particular and in particular information that is re revealed by God to the people however we must then factor in the fact that there is a key observation we must make the observation we must make is that in regard to the gift of the Holy Spirit we must understand and we know this that in the Old Testament the Holy Spirit was only temporal and it was conditional upon select people. So even the prophets that were prophets were prophets 
only because they had the anointing of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, resting upon them and resting upon them temporarily and on condition. So they were prophesying only to the extent that the Holy Spirit was upon them. That's in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we understand that every one of us has received the Holy Spirit. So there is now no distinction to say that there is some who are prophets or there are some who are occupying the prophetic environment in the name of the Lord needs them to be the ones to speak to us because we are all indwelled by the same Spirit. We are all indwelled by the Holy Ghost. Glory to the Father. Glory. We are all indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So there is no difference. There is no difference. We are all indwelled by the Holy Spirit. None amongst us has a higher power. None among us has more powers than others. Hmm. None among us is indwelled by another spirit. Unless it were true that they are not amongst us. The New Testament, we all have received the Holy Spirit. We all have the Holy Ghost indwelling in us. Especially all of those who are truly born again. We have the Holy Ghost inside us. He's inside. He indwells you. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Spirit that was in all the times, in the Old Testament, only a privilege of the few, is now the liberty or the privilege of all. It's not the privilege of all. <laughs> so all have the potential. Look at this word, potential I'm using here. All have the potential to exercise the giftings of the Holy Ghost. Including prophecy. All of us. All of us. We, we will take time next week to speak about the functionality that is the practicality of this office. Particularly in this day and age. Because I believe that the Holy Spirit is still working amongst us to bring about the fruit of prophecy or the gift of prophecy. So when you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 11, the Bible says to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Again, the word common good for the building up of the church comes back again. For the common good, for to one is given through the Spirit utterance of wisdom, to another utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same the one spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. All of these gifts all are empowered by one and the same Spirit, one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individual as that same Spirit wills. So in the New Testament, we have to understand, it, this needs to be drilled into your mind. We have to understand that the Holy Spirit who indwells all, who is one Spirit, who is the same Spirit, apportions to each one of us as he wills his giftings. By reason of exercise and by reason of calling, one can grow. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> so you must understand again that when we say the Holy Spirit who is in all of us gives us each and every one of us as he wills, we are not speaking about offices or ministries in and of themselves. These gifts are not ministries, are not offices in and of themselves. But they are outflows of the one ministry of the Holy Spirit. These are outflows of the one ministry of the Holy Spirit. Glory to the Father. So the Holy Spirit is in ministry. Oh, I wish we could continue. I want us to stop it here. Oh, yes, Father, I thank you. I lift up my hands. In adoration of you. There is just no one like you. 
No one fathers us the way you do. No one fathers us the way you do. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I, I know for a fact that the Lord is intentional about building his church. The Lord is intentional about building his church. The Lord is intentional about building his church. Though there may have been instances of noise, though there had been instances of noise, there is clarity. Clarity. In the intention and the will of God the Father to build his church with the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is clarity. These are the words I'm hearing. Clarity. There is clarity. 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 There is clarity of speech. There is clarity of sight. Vision. There is clarity. Even though there had been instances of noise, there is clarity. There's clarity. I, I don't know how to express this any more than that. That is what the Holy Spirit is insisting that I say. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Wherein there had been silence, now there is clarity of voice. Wherein there had been silence, now there is clarity of voice. And I see this particularly in the area of music, in the area of song, song, wherein there had been tied tongues, now there is an unleashing, a flowing of words with clarity, with clarity, with clarity. The Holy Spirit is in ministry. You see, we are simply servants, custodians who serve at the mercy of the master who himself is in ministry. This is the ongoing work of the Lord Jesus Christ. None amongst us is in ministry in and of themselves. We are simply disposable. Disposable possible vessels. In a house, there are many vessels. In a house, there are many vessels. Some are of honor and some are of dishonor. Now, the word dishonor is positive. They are of lesser honor. But in a house, there are many vessels. But they are all vessels that are disposable, usable to the pleasure of their own master. Oh, thank you, Lord. Friends, let's leave it there. Let's leave it there. We are going to have a blast. A blast. A blast in this series. Don't miss out. I want you to be intentional about your study throughout the week. Go into the Word of God, look for material, read up on books, Google, Google New Testament prophet, Google, get into the Word, read material. Don't read one material and go and preach, or read one material and be a scholar. Read those who are against, read those who are for, listen to those who are against, listen to those who are for. Go back to scripture, assessing if whatever these people are saying is true or not. But get into a habit because what God is unleashing, my goodness, my goodness, let me leave it there. I'm not allowed to say this. Glory to the Father. Let's join in next week. I'm excited. 
oh my spirit is bubbling beyond measure bubbling beyond measure bubbling beyond measure glory to god i'm excited i'm excited i don't know about you i'm excited 